<clears throat> okay, so um, I'm Hamida Glasgow from the Center for Fine Art Photography, um, and we are here tonight for Bootsy Holler's uh, Artist Talk. The way um, this came about was that um, the center, sorry, hold on a second. We need to mute everybody. If everyone could please mute your, because we're hearing noises. And Marcella, if you could go through and mute everyone, that'd be great, thanks. Um, sorry, going back. So um, I've been really interested in the, um, you know, sort of atomic legacy, nuclear legacy. Um, we wrote, I wrote, uh, Katie Kindle and I wrote a grant for the National Endowment for the Arts. We wrote an application um, to do um, a series of programming on, you know, atomic legacy. And, um, and we, we, we got the grant. Um, so we did the Kei Ito show um, last year which some of you um, were able to see and then and or attend his talk. And then um, this year we're doing a show, an exhibition, it's a group exhibition um, called A Thousand Beautiful Lies. And, um, and Bootsy is one of the artists that's in the show. It's been, it was supposed to be happening right now, but it was postponed to the fall. And so um, because we, we the, this documentary screening was part of the whole NEA project, we went ahead with that last week and, um, and, and had um, Bootsy go ahead and give her talk um, tonight. And, and then the exhibition will be later. And the exhibition will include uh, Will Wilson, uh, Kei Ito, um, Abby he um, Hepner, and potentially some others. So stay tuned for that. Um, so we wanted to thank uh, the NEA um, grant, the organization for the grant, um, which is uh, partially funding all of these programs, also Fort Fund um, grant and the Colorado, Colorado Creative Industries grant. So that's a lot of words to say uh, that I'm excited to hear all about Bootsy's work, Contaminated, that is... Um, that is really about uh, her history and her family's history. Um, for those of you that don't know Bootsy, she's an artist and photographer who's been documenting and creating work based on her life, family, memories, and emotions for over 30 years. Stepping outside the flat pin print, Hallara has been creating sculptures through documentary and ephemeral imagery to create new art through a practice she calls stacking. By showing the unseen, she often pushes society to stop and feel when experiencing her work. Her images have been exhibited in museums, galleries, and publications worldwide. She was invited and exhibited at the Shanghai International Photo Festival and Photo Fever Paris. During Photo London, Haller recently exhibited new work revolving around, around the Manhattan Project. In 2019, she published her second monograph, Treasures, Objects I've known all my life. Her seminal work on the Seattle music scene in this permanent is in the permanent collection at the Grammy Museum, and she's cur currently working on a book about her experience documenting the scene and her life in the '90s. So, with that, um, Bootsy, uh, I turn it over to you. Hi. Okay, so I'm going to share screen. And I'm going to move you guys over here, share screen, desktop one, share. Okay. Okay. You guys see the contaminated? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I want to thank Hamida and the Center for Fine Art photography for inviting me to speak on my project Contaminated. Um, some of you might have watched the documentary Richland last week directed by Irene Mutzig, which I've yet to see. However, as you will soon discover, I've lived the experience of Richland. Uh, thank you all for listening today. I appreciate your interest and I look forward to answering questions later. Um, this talk is about how I got to the place of creating Contaminated 
and the secret place where I grew up, my family, and their, where they worked from the 1940s through 2021. First, I want to introduce myself a little bit more so you know who I am uh, as an artist. My name is Bootsy Holler, not my birth name, and I'm from Richland, Washington. The area I know, uh, th this area is known as a government town full of science and research. As a child, I had a natural talent for arts and crafts, and in a town of biologists, engineers, and physicists, I was not one of them. I didn't think that way, and I did not feel like a great student. When I was 12, I started altering, making, and designing my own clothes. I thought I would be a clothing designer, but received little support to pursue that dream. I, didn't, I did receive a camera early and started documenting and exploring my life, family, and emotions to express myself, and I still do today. But I can't say I ever thought I knew I could be a photographer. I would process my film as a child with Clark's sending it in and getting free film in return as a, in return, writing my own checks with my money from gifts to pay for film processing. On the left, you see me and my older sister with my dad, whom I always looked up to and wanted to hang out with all the time. He was a super cool guy to be around. He was honest, fair, artistic, and analytical. On the right are my sister, my great grandma, and my mom, from whom I most likely got my eye for style, my color palette, and aesthetics. I want you to see a handful of my early work just to show you how I have built installations and curated collections about my life and the people around me for a while. This way you get a better idea of where contaminated came from. This piece is from 1995, and this is the first show I curated of my work at a local coffee shop in Seattle. I called it 10 Short Stories. The work stemmed from my relationship with my boyfriend at the time, who was a heroin addict. During this time, I ran a small design business making high-end craft items, mainly small picture frames made from copper and aluminum, and magnets with photos, selling to high-end craft stores and doing fairs. So I worked with and had access to equipment to work with metal. The pieces here are made from five by seven quarter inch aluminum plates, hemp tied in nooses, silver prints from paper negatives, typed poetry, medium and patina. This was the main wall from this show. You can see my weaving skills and the engineering of the piece coming through. Most of the items I photographed were from my home and the poetry was written about how I felt. The woven design was created to hang the pieces as one and span the work across the wall, making it 10 feet by four feet tall. The noose design was how, how I was able to level all the images. Here's a closer look at the nooses and the images, a pair, a platform shoe, a pennyworth. Oh, the simplicities and complications of being 25. This is how I felt. The words are unnecessary, as you can tell how I'm feeling just by looking at the pieces. I often felt like words were not my strong point and they made me feel vulnerable. However, I love text and the idea of text. I speak in pictures and don't usually need words to tell me how something feels. So I always thought others were like this, but most people need words. I'm expressing myself here in this piece, but I don't have words to understand my actual feelings and why I made this work. Then in 1997 and 98, I created 28 a poem about being 28 and my mother not understanding why I was unmarried and had no children. <laughs> the images were made on a point and shoot camera. The work is all self portraits. Also, I didn't study photography when I went to college because I still thought I'd be a designer. So I taught myself how to print color and work and would drive up to Vancouver, BC from Seattle to print this series because I had a space to stay and the dollar was so strong, it was 40% off. I took a few black and white photography classes in college, but I'm self-taught and worked as a freelance photographer in Seattle for 15 years. 
Here's a little closer look of 28, a collection of 28 color negative C-type prints featuring white paint pen, poetry, beeswax, paraffin, and gold leaf on wood frames. When the images are hung together, it creates a piece that is approximately 10 feet by four and a half feet tall. The inspiration for this project came after a heated argument with my mother on Christmas night, during which she said very, very hurtful words. The next day, I drove back to Seattle and wrote the poem, which inspired the self-portrait photo shoot. Each photo in the shoot corresponds to a line from the poem. This body of work explores the feelings of not being understood or appreciated. 2001-2006, Ruby and Willie is a collection of images I photographed in my grandpa Willie's home in Richland. My grandma passed away many years earlier from cancer and the house sat like a movie set in stasis as my grandpa lived in the basement rooms and the kitchen. I felt compelled to document the space as a place and time that would no longer exist at some point. A month after my first time documenting, my grandpa fell ill and like a premonition within months, the house and everything in it was gone. I spent much of my life growing up in this house as I lived 10 minutes away from it. I bought my first color printer to make this series and I could now afford to print scanned negatives. The collection has 52 images. I constructed the boxes and then mounted the cotton fiber paper to the boxes with book binding glue. The work was put in, a small, in small collections representing one room so you could walk around the gallery and see each room in the house. Here you see the basement room on the left and then Willie's bedroom. I shot about 26 rolls of 35 millimeter film. The boxes are 20 by 12 by two inches. I printed on Moab, Moab paper at the time, Moab and Trotta. I made a book for this work and installed a group of seven across by five down in a similar grouping to this in a commercial film office. I found many people my age and older connect to this work. In 2011, I created a series for a class taught by Aline Smithson after I relocated to LA. The assignment was to create a self-portrait and I decided to use my collection of family photos, which I had taken from Ruby and Willie's home. I used the images and my love for vintage clothing to create a moment that takes me back in time. I took photographs of myself under similar lighting conditions and then inserted myself into the family photos. This work helped me gain a better understanding of my mother and the DNA that is passed down from generation to generation. Often trauma experienced by previous generations can be passed down to each child. Each image is labeled in white ink and with my handwriting telling you who I'm visiting. I hung this work a few times, sometimes in a group collection, but in this instance at Wall Space Santa Barbara with Krista Dix, you might know her as, um, she's now at the Griffin Museum in the Northeast. But I met Krista in Seattle before she had a gallery. So I made a timeline. Uh, so her, she and I had a really good connection. And um, so she let me do whatever I wanted. And I made a timeline with black chalkboard paint and staggered the 20 images down the wall by date. The frames are 14 by 14 inches. The images are made to match the original candid photo with deckled edges if needed. It's a study of family lineage from a more personal perspective on my mother's side of the family. I could relate to her in each image. She told me stories and I learned about our family's past. Then uh, just recently between 2016 and 22, I created Without Words. For one of the images, I made a nest that I built and then did a self-portrait sitting inside it. I'd always wanted to build a nest, <laughs> don't we all? And on a meditation retreat in Hawaii, I had the chance to build one. This nest is very big and can fit up to about three people. For a gallery exhibition, I wanted my viewers to understand that the nest was something I created. So I made a new small nest for presentation with the work on the walls. This can be seen here in this photo at Building Bridges in Santa Monica. Without words is about destroying ourselves by not understanding or caring for our environment, trees, animals, and insects that are all our same biology. We must take care of them or they will take us out. I wanted to have people connect to the beauty of nature and that if we, don't, if we care for her, she will heal us. 
Okay. Uthi, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt for just, yeah. if you could either speak loud, a little bit louder or turn your face a little bit more towards the camera, that would be helpful. It, your voice is getting a little bit lower. I can probably speak louder. Um, and harder to hear. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. So plutonium and production waste. How's that sound? Good. Okay. Now, you know, some backstory on my mind, hands and how I create. Let's talk uh, and learn a bit about plutonium 239 and radioactive waste. This image is the Hanford nuclear reservation in 1940, where the B reactor sits at White Bluffs on the Columbia River in Washington state. B reactor was the first of its kind at this scale and produced some of the first plutonium. I grew up 35 miles from Hanford in Richland, the closest town. Due to the current cultural climate and the recent release of the film Oppenheimer, more people seem to understand the story I'm about to tell. When I mention where I'm from and use terms like plutonium bomb or Hanford nuclear reservation, most people give me a blank stare and struggle to relate. However, the history is very nuanced, starting with the many scientists who worked together to discover nuclear fusion. Oppenheimer, a theoretical physicist, was responsible for weapons production and designing the bomb at Los Alamos. But Hanford and Savannah River locations were massive and hundreds of people worked at these locations to make it all happen. You see on the right, Washington State and the red circle showing the Hanford site's location. The Columbia River on the left in the close-up map shows the outer red lines of the 625 square miles occupied by the US government in 1942. The red blocks are buildings and reactors created between 1943 and 1945. This desert steppe land region had low shrubs, water, and a very low population of farmers and indigenous people in the 1940s, making it precisely what they were searching for in a location to place the first nuclear reactor and plutonium processing plant. The reactor is now part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park and is the far left reactor next to the Columbia River. How to make plutonium? <laughs> uh, fission. Fission, a process in which a nucleus divides in two. So if you look at the top um, photo, fission of uranium, in the case of uranium or plutonium, this process relates addition, uh, releases additional neutrons, which can split more nuclei, leading to a chain reaction. You see this in the top image in the fourth spot where it says energy. You see the extra three neutrons released? Uh, that will then impact more atoms and so on and so on, causing the chain reaction. But the waste in the splitting of uranium also gives you barium and krypton. Barium is highly toxic to humans and animals. The image below in the one spot, so looking at the producing plutonium image, um, shows that to produce plutonium, you need a moderator, which they used water, and you need U-238, uranium-238. So if, you, if you're looking at the little pictures, you destabilize the uranium, which turns it to U-239, which becomes Neptunium and then Plutonium. So the two elements following Uranium-238 in, in like uh, the number two spot, it becomes unstable. And, and it, that means it has a very short half-life. So so it only is like 23 minutes and then it changes into um, uh, it changes into the, uh, the, the Neptunium and then that takes two and a half days because it's also unstable and then it becomes plutonium. So unlike those two um, that have very short half-lives, um, plutonium-239 has a half-life of more than 24,000 years. 
So when it comes to nuclear cleanup, it is challenging element to contain safely for that long. Doing all this production for plutonium produces a lot of waste. Waste has to be contained. And at the same time, back in the 1940s, it was also being researched to see how it affected humans and the environment. B reactor. So this is inside the B reactor. Uranium is processed with the help of fuel rods to convert it into plutonium. So you see the men in the reactor um, and they're all suited up, but only some of them are wearing their hazmat hoods. So the... <laughs> Those rods are, are stuck in there and you see the steam, that's the water keeping all those rods cool as the uranium is being turned into plutonium and making heat. So the water cools down these rods before they pass through another chemical system that retrieves the plutonium. However, the process generates um, large amounts of chemical waste, contaminated water and high level radioactive sludge all for a small amount of usable plutonium. Uh, this is Fat Man. This image shows the pit inside the blue circle. So fat, um, the pit, which sits in the middle of the bomb, holds the plutonium. So the pit in Fat Man, which was the code name uh, for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, was about the size of a softball and weighed close to 14 pounds. The result when they dropped it was that it only used 2.2 pounds that, you know, uh, was able to go through fission before it exploded. So that means out of all, uh, out of the, you know, 13 and a half pounds that were inside that softball, only 16% of it um, reacted when they dropped it. Okay, so here's, these are the tank farms. So Hanford has different processes for different types of waste. Slightly contaminated liquids are stored in ponds. Solid waste is buried. So that's these tank farms. And some gases are released into the air. So across the reserve are approximately 1600 waste sites. So, you know, similar to those tank farms. And they're currently holding approximately 25 million cubic feet of solid radioactive waste buried in these trenches and tunnels. So on the left is the tank farm and on the right is a burial of a fuselage from a reactor. And you can get an idea of the size of this hole next to the man on the right. But to understand what 25 million cubic feet is, is another slide. Um, Imagine 1,000 feet, which is about the length of three football fields. And if we imagine this length in both directions and form a square, we get a million square feet. Now make 25 more cubes of the three football fields. That's how much is underground there. This is the F reactor. The F reactor is the last of the three original plutonium production reactors built as part of the Manhattan Project during World War II. It operated from 1945 to 1965. The Hanford reactors started to be decommissioned at the end of the Cold War in 1987. This is what a decommissioned reactor looks like. It is cocooned in eight feet of cement. The Hanford site contains two thirds of the United States radioactive waste and is the country's most extensive environmental cleanup. Declassified. Declassified is a series about the beauty of this contaminated land. I photographed um, around this area, uh, you know, around the whole area of the Hanford area is what we call it. Um, Throughout 2014, while I was visiting my father and talking to him about his job when he worked at the Department of Energy, DOE. In 2004, I stopped to photograph this, si this sign for the first time. I used to drive back to Richland from Seattle to visit my family, and I would come in the back way, as we called it, 
driving down the east side of the Columbia River. The Hope Sign is located near the Wanapum Dam, which brought hope to the area because of the work it provided later uh, that it provided. Later, it became one of the reasons why Southeast Washington was chosen as a reactor site due to the availability of electricity. This image inspired my project, but it wasn't until 2014 that I spent significant time documenting the land. All the images you will see are shot on film with my twin lens Rolleiflex. You're observing nine cocooned reactors across the river with the pink Saddle Mountain in the background. This geographic, geographical area has remained unchanged by man since the last ice age over 10,000 years ago. The Columbia River is the last 50 miles of wild river in the United States. The government's ownership of this land prevented the installation of a dam planned to be built there. Although the land is undoubtedly polluted, the Hanford area comprises extensive uninterrupted tracts of healthy arid land where several mammals, birds, and insects dwell. In today's world, it's rare to find a piece of nat nature untouched by humans in this way. In December, 1942, one year after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, President Franklin D. Roosevelt claimed the 625 acres of desert steppe land near the Columbia River in Washington State for the top secret Manhattan Project. Up to that point, the region had been a quiet farming community. Still, due to its unique ecological and geographical prop properties, it was chosen to be the home of the, worst, of the world's first plutonium reactor. This land is now considered the most toxic land in North America. I wanted to document the land around Hanford as a testament to resilience in the face of man's destructive capacity. As a native of this profoundly secretive and conflicted place, I grew up in a culture where larger truths were never known. My father managed nuclear operations at Hanford and began to speak about working at the Department of Energy when I visited him throughout 2014. As an artist, I'm drawn to Hanford's many ironies not the least of which are the extreme beauty of the untouched land that covers a vast amount of toxic waste. A high school mascot that symbolizes my hometown's infamy, a nuclear mushroom cloud, and streets, na street names which record the legacy that led to the death of so many people and changed the course of history. The story of Hanford had been a national secret one that few people fully understood until August 1945, when the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Only in the wake of those 135,000 deaths did the people of Hanford and Richland begin to learn the purpose of their town to produce the plutonium that fueled one of the United States nuclear bombs. It's been a steady and unflinching process of coming to terms with the history of my town, its fraught place in North American history and my family's role in the town. It's been an enormous undertaking for me to discover and portray the many contradictions and secrets inherent in a place that has come to be as this one did. This is the federal building where my dad worked for the Department of Energy and to the right is a vintage badge. This is not my dad. Everyone who works in the area for any company, like I did when I was younger for Battelle Northwest Labs, wears a badge. And in the back of the badge is a dosimeter that is used to check and see how much radiation you get each year. Here's a collection of declassified, just so you can kind of see them all together. Okay, here we go. Contaminated. Uh, moving on to contaminated project. In 1942, my grandfather, Willie Warford, my mother's dad, 
one of the first employees hired as a surveyor to build the world's first nuclear reactor. He later worked as the supervisor of the energy system group for Hanford on the graveyard shift. The picture is Ruby and Willie in the yard of their government R house. Depending on your job, you were able to get a specific home. Willie passed away in 2001 in Richland at the age of 87, still living in that home. This is my dad's dad, my grandpa Rhodes. He was brought out by DuPont. DuPont was contracted to build the reactors. He was a chemist and worked in TNT before joining the Hanford Works. He was one of the few who knew what was being made at Hanford, as everything was compartmentalized to keep the secret. My grandpa Dusty believed that his job at Hanford was his duty as a US citizen at the time. At this time, the United States was working against a clock as we thought the Germans were ahead of us in making a super bomb and they were taking over Europe and moving into Africa. The US government kept such poor records regarding what was done and not done to protect employees that the Department of Labor now has the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act, which started in 2001. The Illness Compensation Act now compensates employees with illnesses released or related to exposure to radioactive and toxic substances. If there is a 51% chance you are ill from living and working and have one of these issues on the list here, you will qualify. Unfortunately, that didn't happen in, the in 1941 when radioactive iodine was released into the air for testing. The front page of the Richland Villager paper, August 6, 1945, the day that the locals working at Hanford realized what they had been involved in creating. Fat Man, the plutonium bomb, dropped on Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. This decision was taken in response to Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. So from 1941 to 1945, that's how fast they built everything and created the production of plutonium. So during World War II, Germany, Italy, and Japan, all led by fascist leaders, formed the Tripartite Pact. This development of a nuclear bomb was accelerated to try and catch up to the Germans who were believed to be ahead of us in developing nu nuclear super bombs. I designed a newspaper with information on my project and sitting on top is a Geiger counter for reading radi radiation or acting as a pay to per weight. So the story is complicated as you can tell. Um, so the newspaper accompanies the work. So often I bring the little newspaper with me when I show the work and people can take, you know, walk away with it and read it. Here's my first idea for representing an illness by burning through a photo of my grandfather. The layers represent all the secrets and all the people affected by working at the Hanford site. This sculpture is my grandfather, Dusty, the chemist. He had thyroid and stomach cancer, both of which are on the list for the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. Many years after his death, when the act became available in 2001, my sister and I encouraged my dad to apply for survivor benefits. My father and his sister were compensated in a lump sum payment of 150,000 for my grandfather's illnesses, which were most likely caused by working in the area. Here are a few pictures showing each image layered up from the side. And then there's the back. It's about the size of a brick. This was supposed to be just a sample, but it doesn't want to scale up in the same way. So this is a one of one. I previously exhibited some of my artwork in a group show at Foley Gallery in New York. You can see the size of the sculptures are small. The larger images in the background depict the Columbia River image you saw earlier, and the triptych is 24 by 72 inches. 
The back pictures of the Columbia River Reach are vinyl and the top piece is acrylic. The acrylic represents the vitrification process that aims to contain the waste in a Pyrex type glass at Hanford to prevent future leaks in the ground. And in the front, you see the newspaper and Geiger counter sitting on a vintage fruit box from Washington State. This is my mom. As a toddler, my mom, uh, as a toddler, my mother, Virginia, or as we call her, Ginger, um, came to Richland. Her father, my grandpa, Willie, one of the first surveyors on the land, uh, brought the family out from Missouri. My mother had two mastectomies soon after she turned 50. And because she had lived in Richland her whole life and worked out at Battelle Labs for many years, she too qualified for the Compensation Act of 150,000 for breast cancer. The view on the right shows the stacking, a bit different than the earlier piece. I've named this style of work I'm doing as stacking. It gives the image more integrity and turns it into a handmade sculpture. This is from Photo London 2023. I framed four of the 20 breast cancer sculptures and added the vinyl newspaper image on the wall. The breast cancer pieces are only about four by five by two inches deep and they're sewn with embroidery thread. The frame has no glazing. Each of the 20 sewn pieces is different and represents the many women who may have developed breast cancer. Here's a wide shot showing my mom's sculptures on the right and my second wall on the left showing more contaminated. My father became assistant manager for the safety operations at Hanford during the 1980s. He worked for the Department of Energy for 21 years. He was never able to talk about his work and rarely was I able to visit his office in the federal building in Richland. Part of his job was deciding which documents should be declassified. Many of the papers he remembers keeping classified were likely evidence of the nuclear testing events that led to his own father's stomach and thyroid cancer. This sculpture, it's a little bit bigger than the one of, of his father, my grandpa Dusty. I used the button on the lips and the classified stamp to represent the secrets he kept and the, mother, and the many other employees that did too. Wanda is a friend of the family. She became sick and qualified for the Compensation Act of 150,000. Plutonium-239 looks unnatural. Its bright fluorescent green poses a radioactive danger to anyone working with it or living in that region. Its effects are slow and silent. The line of green here represents the depth of damage that this chemical has caused by seeping into the ground, the water, the people's bodies over years. In 2023, when I went to Photo London and exhibited parts of contaminated, I decided to print 20 by 16 Im inch images of the small sculptures. Here you can see them all together. This is Julia. She's uh, representing one of my dad's best friends, Chet. Chet died of brain cancer. He was a brilliant engineer. His wife was able to apply for survivor benefits and was also able to get reimbursed for some of the doctor and hospital bills they paid. So she received 300,000 in total. This layered piece also cut by hand <laughs> was challenging, but I now have a laser cutter to help me and have started some new designs. I decided to use a woman to balance the group out seeing that hundreds of women also worked out at Hanford in the 1940s. Here's the presentation of my other wall at Photo London. I used a combination of vinyl lettering state, uh, for the statement and a 40 by 40 inch adhesive g clay print from Declassified alongside the frame 16 by 20s. I had the opportunity to speak to small VIP groups each morning. It was a challenging task to compress everything into five minutes. This is Lou and Dusty Rhodes again, my grandparents, my dad's dad and mom. This image represents my grandfather's stomach ulcers after working at Hanford for 10 years. 
They were so bad that he stopped work and left the area, but returned in the mid 1960s because my father and aunt were living in Richland with the grandkids. This was the first piece I created on the laser cutter. The images are mounted on mat board and stacked. I've placed spacers between them to help with the depth. I'm able to create larger pieces with the boards and laser cutter. This is about 12 and a half square and three inches thick. My mom's mom, Ruby, died in 1978 in Richland. She was very ill throughout my childhood and we were never quite sure where her cancer started. But the thought was that it started in her uterus and then it made its way up to her liver. I made this piece to represent Grandma Ruby and all the women, <clears throat> all the women who have been diagnosed with uterine cancer. I have another part to this piece I haven't added, so it's a work in progress. I used a black mat board this time for this piece and a vintage image of two Ukrainian women. This is my aunt Sarah, my dad's sister. If I remember correctly, she worked at the Federal Building in Human Resources. She applied for the Compensation Act after getting lung cancer, but she didn't qualify because she had smoked cigarettes. She passed away in 2016. This piece, also made on the laser cutter, saving my hands and wrists, is the color, is the color that reminds me of nicotine. The image had odd yellow stains on it, which was perfect in a way, and I embraced it with the yellow. This one had the most parts to work with and assemble. Plus, I'm working on the computer, making the color enhancements to each image on each level. This is also 12 and a half squarish and three inches deep. So they can stand on their own um, or they can hang on the wall. This is the last sculpture I'm working on right now. Um, I have some other ideas, but this is where I'm at now. John was a brilliant geoscientist who researched the movement of radioactive particles through groundwater under Hanford. He worked for Battelle Northwest Labs and received top honors in science from both Battelle and DOE. John was about 15 years younger than my father, and I see him as another wave of workers now focused on cleanup that will unfortunately fall ill. John passed away in 2021 from a rare form of leukemia. I met John when he married my best friend from high school. He was a friendly, talkative, athletic person who loved climbing mountains. John's wife got survivor benefits from the Compensation Program Act. This piece is much larger. larger. It's 24 by 42, plus the yarn falls to the floor in a puddle. I'm still hand cutting and building up the stacking parts. It's still a work in progress. This is a found image I'm using to represent John and his love of climbing mountains. My art reflects my surroundings, encompassing the individuals, locations, and events I encounter. When we delve into our family history, we can gain insight into our identity and place within our family lineage. By piecing together our past, we can discover answers to our queries and more deeply comprehend ourselves. It's been a mental and physical undertaking for me to discover and portray the many contradictions and secrets inherent in a place that came to be Hanford. In the simplest form, all my work is about identity, but I often say it's about family and emotions. My work stems from having visions or pictures in my mind, and then I figure out how to make them with my hands. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Okay. That was fantastic, Bootsy. Thank you. I'll stop. Escape. Stop. Uh, um, so much to process. I know. <laughs> I was trying to rally through. Yeah. I'm sure that that's a difficult, it's difficult to talk about. Um, <laughs> I know. Let's get a little vacant in places. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a great presentation. Thank you for walking us through so much of the, 
sort of some of the science behind it and and then also you know your family's um history and um so many tragedies associated with it um i we are uh we can take some questions now if anyone has questions we're getting comments uh wow incredible body of work and evolution bootsy um great talk thank you if you want to um speak you can un if you want to ask a question you can unmute yourself and and ask a question I can just say that I've seen this work from the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, and how Bootsy's pulled it all together in your talk today, Bootsy. I'm so proud of you and so amazed. It was really incredible. You did a really good job. Thanks, Lisa. Agreed. I'm excited to show the work in person. Um, Any other I'm complicated so questions? <laughs> Michael is is asking, um, this is Bootsy, what's your intent or meaning when you layer those images? Yeah, I mean, I said it, it's, it's like, it's not just one person. It's not just my grandfather. It's, you know, how many other people got the same illness, you know? It's not just one person. There's hundreds of people that have the same issues. So the layers are representing like not only all the people, but all the layers to the complications of what this whole, you know, creating of plutonium and the layers of secrets and the layers of pollution. And so for me, I just saw layers. And so when I made that first sculpture, I, you know, I burned through a single image, you know, and I was like, oh, that's cool. But it's so much more than that. And then that was what triggered the stacking, you know, and so then I, you know, printed multiple images and stacked them up. And that's, but I had done stacking on another project, but in a very small way on the without words on a couple images I had stacked on top of the original image just to give some of them like a little bit of a 3D vibe. And so that's where I had done it first. And so it just kind of bounced over there, and like, you know, blew up in my head. And so then I started creating the stacking for all the sculptures and the stacking is what kind of is guiding me through what I decide to create, you know? Yeah. Other questions? Oh, you have some comments. Yeah. Um, uh, show the results of exposure to reactive materials in the Disney Super Bowl. So powerful. Okay. I was making sure there wasn't a question in there. Yeah, I tried to be thorough. You know, like I was like, it's such a complicated story. Um, and I kept going over it, trying to be like, you know, does this make sense? You know, so, you know, when I've explained things before, um, you know, like about declassified in the land, you know, it's really hard to comprehend, you know, wh why is there so much waste out there? Why, you know, what, it, it takes so much energy and chemicals to make plutonium and to just get a clean small part you know piece that goes inside you know it's it's right it's and to your point waste. sorry I, I stepped yeah. on top of you that's okay it, well and to your point uh during the talk when you talked about when you had the the image of fat boy and mm -hmm. then the you know the the um the detailed uh not description. Yeah. Drawing. So yeah, yeah. So Fat Man, that that's the bomb that carried the plutonium. And right. so I didn't get into Fat Man, but you know, the 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 idea was everything had to, it had to all compact down 
and push it all in to then explode, right? You had to have it all go boom, 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 boom. And so it, it was the complication of what they did at Los Alamos was building that bomb, you know, where the complications at Hanford were building a reactor that's never been built before and creating plutonium, which has never been made. And then, you know, putting it on a train and sending it to Los Alamos where they're all researching and figuring out, well, now that we have this, how do we make it explode? How do we make that chain reaction happen? You know? So yeah, like, there's just so many layers to understanding what's going on out there. And then talking about the Richland documentary, you know, like, and people's, it's kind of, you know, a little bit canary in the coal mine, you know, we all live there and grow up there and that's your job. And, you know, it's, it's, you're not gonna, you know, if you don't want to live there, yeah, get up and leave, but you got to go get a job somewhere else. I mean, that's one of the, you know, places, if you're a scientist, that's one of the biggest re research places to go work, you know, is there. And we don't have enough Americans to, to work out there and do that kind of research in science. And so, when I actually, the last time, you know, times I was in Richland, it's like people speaking German, people speaking Russian. I mean, there's scientists from all over the world that are there because we literally don't have enough scientists in America, <laughs> you know? You know, one of the things that um, in our conversations um, in talking about your work for the show and for the talk, um, I, I've been struck by there's a, um, there's and 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 this also struck me um, in this in the screening of Richland um, that when when she talks when the filmmaker talks to people in town and interviews people in town um, a lot of people are very am, am, ambiguous about what was created there how they're you know how it yeah. sort of you know like a lot of people are saying like it's a it was it's a great place to live it's a great place to grow up it's a great community you know all of these different things about it um and um and that's one of the things i i i i found really interesting is that you know is the is the way that people who grew up there or live their work uh you know feel about it now and this actually relates to a question Andrew says Bootsy from talking to people there do you have any sense of what different choices if any they would have made if they had known what was coming no I mean like what I said like so my feeling about the area and what I grew up with and how I you know I don't it, it's it's a pride and I know that she kind of got that across in the movie, you know, of like, here we created something in such a short amount of time that was, you know, a scientific and engineering feat that had never been done. You know, it's just unfathomable to think of getting something done like that now, you know, so that there is a pride of all the hard work that went to create that area and the science and research they're doing out there. So, I mean, they knew enough to try to put it into fucking barrels. They, they, they didn't do that in other countries. They just poured that shit into the river. So like, yes, it's messed up and it's, not not you know great and then damage the the land and they're trying to make sure it doesn't pollute the columbia river and everything out there right now um is about like how how do we encase this stuff because it's gonna live forever and how do we take care of it and 
just the fact that they want to do that is is amazing you know and then when you think about you know that that area is just kind of left alone like yes there's science and research buildings out there and the reactors are all covered up and they're de dealing with the science of how do we put this how do we encase all this in glass right and then you know the glass won't ever leak, you know, and we don't have to worry about it a million years from now, you know? So, um, but it's a beautiful land that's like, doesn't have a million roads on it, doesn't have a huge city built on it. I mean, we damage everything. I mean, a city damages everything. So it's like, how do you look outside of what, you know, what they did there that they thought they needed to do to stop, you know, World War II, you know, I mean, it was like, that's where they were. They were yeah. like fighting for their lives, you know? So wow. you have to be in that mindset of where those people were at that time. My grandfather was like, I, that was my duty. It was my job. I mean, he wasn't going to war. But he, they were all fighting their war with their science. And that's how they thought about it. It was their job to be, as a citizen, to, to help to do this. You know, that's where yes, all sir. that pride comes from. Yeah. yeah. Other, than, other than the compensation people received, were, were there other ways they were honored? You know, for the work they did, for I mean, the lives they gave up? I mean, not really. I mean, that that all happened in 2001. And, you know, people had to fight for that to happen. And that's not to mention there's a whole nother uh, lawsuit that happened pre the 2001 act that's the downwinders. So those are all people that live downwind of Richland and got it in a different way. I think that's really what triggered this other you know act to happen in 2001 but no i mean but listen i mean my dad would say you know you know the government's totally fucked up i mean he doesn't pretend it they have their shit together you know he's seen the inside you know and you know you how do you go to the american public and say we're making a bomb and you know, it just doesn't happen. You think you're doing something for the better of all, right? So yeah. yeah, you know, it's complicated, but it stopped World War II, you know? Did, did they need to throw a second bomb down? I don't know, you know? Yeah, I think that's where the stacking to me is, um, is it, it, it's a metaphor for for all of those layers of you know of what people knew what people didn't know what the you know and and all uh, over time what's happened there yeah. and continues to happen you know some people have, have have said some comments in the in the chat about you know what about the animals and you know um and and then you know if you think about like you know, the indigenous populations there and, and their lands. And, you know, it's very complicated. It's very like, you know, that stacking is so perfect for this project. And they're trying, you know, they tried to find the best area, you know, that qualified all these things, you know, they needed water, they needed electricity, they needed cement. And there was a lot of gravel there that was brought down by the ice ages and um and they needed a place that was you know not close to any other country and it barely like it's actually slightly too close to canada but they went for it anyways um and it had to not it, there had to be not very many people there you know so the displacement of a thousand people um and they told them they were going to get get to go back there in like five years but you know the government is just in the last you know 10 to 15 years or 20 years I don't know 
started giving the land back to Washington state because there's like a uh, bird, you know, all the birds land there. So they have a whole place where, you know, it's a little refuge for all the birds and, you know, there's elk out there. There's the animals thrive because there's no people. It's us. Yeah. It's us, you know? So, yeah. yeah. But that's what makes it complicated, you know? Yes, they definitely. Tried. They definitely. tried. They tried. There's no good answer. I mean, we bomb the ocean. You know, it's like we we still do this shit today in other ways. Absolutely. 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 So complicated. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you, Bootsy. It's, um, it was, it was great to hear you speak about this. Um, again, I'm excited to show the work <laughs> and, um, thank you everyone for, for joining us, um, for tonight's talk and, um, in what's February, March, April, uh, Lou Peralta will be giving an artist talk that's in under our events tab. So, um, hopefully you'll sign up for that as well. And, um, again, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Hamida. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.